next thing is molecular shape. So molecules have specific shapes, um, and we predict these shapes using this, which is the valence electron valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, which is the Vesper. Um, essentially, this theory says that like charges repel, so all electrons which are negative um, will try to be as far away from each other as possible. Um, so the more electrons you have in that sort of valence shell, or the more electrons you have on those individual sort of atoms, the more you're going to get a different shape. So shape is determined by the two factors, the number of covalent bonds and the number of lone pairs. Don't worry about covalent bonds, we'll get into those in a bit. So, so it's about before molecules. Molecules have different atoms. So here we've got a molecule called methane. Um, and so methane has one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. Um, and methane has a tetrahedral shape. Um, and so in cases when there are no lone pairs, which means there are no electrons left by themselves, um, you have four single bonds, the molecule will form a tetrahedral arrangement, which looks like this. So in 3D, this one's probably going back, this one's here, this one's coming towards us, and then this one's just going up. So think of it as you've got a 3D shape and then you want things to be as far away from each other as possible. So you're probably looking somewhat like that. A bit confusing to think of um, without seeing it in 3D. But essentially, that's what that is there. Um, pyramidal. So pyramidal um, is when you have three single bonds. And so in this case here, um, and you have a lone pair, which means there's two electrons just... Oh, you have two electrons... was really struggling, apologies. Um, you have two electrons just sitting over here. Um, and so essentially these two electrons are just sort of sitting by themselves and they sort of repulse these things away from them at the same time. Um, and that's what we get there. Um, so pyramidal is three single bonds. Then you have V-shaped, which is where, once it decides to load, um, V-shaped you have um, two lone pairs of electrons and two single bonds and the molecules will form a V shape or a bent shape. And so essentially what you get is this shape here where you've got the two sort of single pairs of electrons which are floating there by themselves and then you've got your hydrogen coming out there. And then lastly you have linear which is where you have three lone pairs of electrons on something and then your other molecule has a single bond and that's what it looks like. It looks like a straight line. So now that we know sort of, now that we know the periodic table, we know shapes of molecules, we know just sort of basic atom terminology, let's look into some different types of molecules and compounds. And let's look at how these things change and how they are different in terms of their properties determined by their bonds. So I've given a quick little overview here of just like what you need to know about each one of them. And we're gonna start off with the bonds. So we're gonna start off with bonding and then we'll go into each of these different types of elements. So we'll go through metals and then we'll go through ionic substances and then non-metal compounds we don't really need to go through because it's kind of covered all the way through. But we're gonna start off with bonding because bonding is where the next most important aspect is now. Bonding is super high yield for unit 3-4. So if there's anything you're gonna to learn today, this is what's really important. Know your bonding because this stuff will come up in unit 3-4. So there are two main categories of bonding. We have intra versus inter. Um, so intra means, um, this is gonna kill me. So let's get rid of this. Apologies. We're just going to go with cable. This might be a bit quicker. I think it's the, my computer's struggling and therefore, uh, shouldn't need to trust it. I've already trusted it. Oh.
is in one second. Right, that is the way. So now we're going to look at this. And then during the break, I'm going to have a fiddle around and see if I'm going to do that. Because this, I reckon, is boring. And you're going to do, we go old school. We're just going to go up on here. So I'm not going to be able to take everyone, apologies. Um, but we're going to get it up on here. Because this might work a little bit better. All right, let's go through with this. So, essentially, jumping back in, I can't annotate, but it's not going to be as good. So, we're going to pick a good green. So we have intra versus intermolecular bonds. So think about your intranet at your school versus your internet. So your intranet should probably consist of maybe you have like a Moodle page or maybe you've just got like your own little portal where your teachers put up your, your homework and where you've got your Zoom classes during COVID and things like that. That's your intranet. That's within your school. Then you have the internet, which is within all the schools. So think about internet as connecting all the schools so you can, just, you can chat with other students from other schools, other teachers from other schools, etc. Um, you can go online. That's internet. Then you have intranet is just within your own school. So for molecules, you have intramolecular bonds, which are in between the individual molecule, as you can see here. Or you have intermolecular bonds, which are in between different molecules. So this is so these are the same molecules as water and water. But in this case here, they're different molecules. This is one water molecule, this is another water molecule. This bond is between them. This is intermolecular bonds. Intramolecular bonds are in between the individual atoms. So, the first and only intramolecular bond you need to know is covalent bonding. So, these are intramolecular bonds. Um, the atoms in non-metal compounds are held together with covalent bonds, um, meaning the atoms share electrons to fill their outer shells. This results in them forming molecules with different um, shapes depending on structures of the outer shell and atoms, which we just discussed. So essentially, um, covalent bonds share electrons, um, as you can see here. So as we've talked about before, the sort of valence electrons are really important. Shells, what, what electrons or what atoms want to do is they want to fill their outer shell. They want to have their outer shell as full as possible. They want to have it... Um, with absolutely nothing left over. They want to have every single spot in their outer shell filled. Um, and most outer shells only take eight electrons. So what they'll do is they'll go and share electrons with other molecules to fill their outer shell. Oxygen, for example, has a shape where it's got an oxygen. In its first shell, it's got the two, which is normal. So don't worry about that. There's just two in the first shell. Then in its next shell, it has six. One, two, is going to look terrible, but three four, five, and six. So it's got six. Therefore, it's got two spare spots. They want to fill these spots. They want these spots filled in here. Um, and so essentially what they do is, as you can see here, they share electrons. So they go along and they share electrons. So they are sharing these four electrons, two from this one, two from that one. And essentially when they share them, they both end up with a full outer shell. And that is how we get um, sort of covalent bonding. So co means together, valent means valent electrons, and that's why we call it covalent bonding. As you can see here, um, it talks about how things just want to be stable. Then we go on to intermolecular bonds. That's all you need to know for intermolecular bonds. Intermolecular bonds is a little bit more. There are three types of intermolecular bonds. There are dipole-dipole forces, there is hydrogen bonding, and there are dispersion forces. So there are three types of bonds you need to know for intermolecular bonds. Um, these occur between molecules and the physical properties um, of covalent molecular substances. So let's go through the first time. We'll go through dipole-dipole. So dipole-dipole results from the attraction between partially positive and partially negative sides of polar molecules. So 
We're going to go through polar molecules in a little bit, but essentially, when a molecule is polar, it's slightly positive and slightly negative on either side. It's neutral overall. Overall, this molecule is neutral, but it's got a slightly positive and a slightly negative side. Um, so think of it like a, like a magnet, how a magnet has a slightly positive and a slightly negative, same sort of thing. Slightly positive, slightly negative. Um, and essentially what happens is these weak sort of positive and negative charges attract to each other because obviously positives attract away, but then the negatives and the positives attract together. Um, and you get a little bit of attraction between them. And so you get a little bit of a bond forming between them. And this bond is what we refer to as dipole-dipole. Um, the molecules with stronger dipole-dipole forces will have a higher melting point and higher boiling point. The stronger the polarity, which don't worry about that, essentially just means that there is a stronger attraction. Um, then we have hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are a special type of dipole-dipole force, and they occur between hydrogen atoms, as the name says, and nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So I refer to it as the NOF rule, some people refer to it as the FON rule, but it's one of those three. So hydrogen must bond with one of those three, and it must be a dipole-dipole bond. So there must be a polar molecules involved for this to occur. So oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine are the smallest and most electronegative atoms, um, and therefore when they share with hydrogen, they make an extra strong bond. So hydrogen bonds are a little bit stronger than dipole-dipole, um, and that's just always happens. So hydrogen is stronger than dipole-dipole. And then we have dispersion forces. So these are forces that occur between non-polar substances and they occur between polar substances. They occur in everything. So two things, if you have two molecules, they're going to have dispersion forces no matter what. However, what's really important is dispersion forces are by far the weakest. So think like hydrogen bonds up here, dipole-dipole here, dispersion forces are down on the ground. The special forces are extremely weak and they don't do a lot, but they are there. And so it's something we need to comment on. So as you can see here, here's a little sort of spiel and how we get these forces, but I wouldn't worry too much um, about that. Just understand that dispersion forces are the weakest. So now that we understand these forces, covalent bonds are by far the strongest, but they're intramolecular, so they don't really get broken up. What we break up when we try and break up molecules is we break up the intermolecular bonds. So we break up the hydrogen, dipole-dipole, and the dispersion. So the most important properties to know are these. Um, and we will go through these um, in terms of just like each for, for metals, and we will go through it for ionic substances. But you have boiling points. So boiling point is the first and most important property you need to understand. Um, when increasing the temperature, it's what degree we, do we start to form gas? So think about water, how water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. 100 degrees Celsius is when we have enough force and enough energy to break the intermolecular bonds. We break the bonds between the individual water molecules. So they would have hydrogen bonds, so they'd be quite strong, and that's why we get to 100 degrees before we break them. Melting point is when... Um, increasing the temperature, at what degree do we start to form a liquid from a solid? So if we had water below zero degrees, it's, it's ice. So out of the freezer. Water out of the freezer is ice. But then as you increase the temperature, as you take that ice out, it starts to melt because it goes past zero degrees. And so as we go past zero degrees Celsius, it begins to melt. Then you have the strength. Um, so how strong the intermolecular bonds between um, atoms are. Um, which we've already discussed. Conductivity, which we'll talk about in one second, but essentially it's whether something can pass electricity through it or not. Um, and then solubility is whether something can dissolve in water. 